everyone, and welcome to the show. Zahid, welcome. Thanks for having me, Ryan. It's good to see you. Good to see you too. Okay, we got two hours to talk, and <laughs> I feel like we could probably talk for triple that based on what I know about you as a business person, as a leader. But let's start for the uninitiated, people who don't necessarily know about the organization that you're leading. Can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, happy to. So uh, Green Shield, we're an insurance company, but we're different in that uh, we're a not-for-profit social enterprise. So we don't have shareholders and we exist uh, to advance our social mission, which is improving the health and well-being of Canadians. So very, very different than everywhere I've worked before. I've been entirely publicly traded companies my, my career before joining Green Shield. So that's been really nice. And that whole notion, that social purpose that drives us is right through the organization, the board, management, employees. Um, so that's what makes Green Shield special in that way. And then what we do to fund the activities related to our social mission is that's what we're in business for. Um, so currently we're the fourth largest health and dental insurer in the country. And, um, you know, grown entirely organically over 65 years, where some of the larger ones have also had acquisitions. So pretty good success story. And, uh, you know, when I joined the company in 2018, I was given a mandate by the board to diversify the company a bit and move from just health and dental insurance into becoming a broader health services organization. So um, there's a lot that's been going on on top of the pandemic as we sort of uh, drive a bit of a transformation through the organization. So that's a bit about Green Shield. Okay. Let's decode that though for, for just the, the common listener. So, yeah. you know, people who come from the insurance background are going to know about Green Shield, what you do. Yeah. But for the average listener, what does that mean for the end user of, of your organization? Yeah. So today um, we would pay and administer health and dental claims. So if you go into a, a, a dentist, a chiropractor, if you go into a pharmacy, you know, we're paying those claims. And we've been doing that for 65 years. We actually started by a pharmacist. Um, and that pharmacist, it was, it's a wonderful origin story. So his name was Bill Wilkinson. And the idea that became Green Shield happened when a young mother walked into a store and she had two prescriptions to fill, but she could only afford one. So that social issue of access to affordable prescription drugs really impacted him. And that led to the development of North America's first prepaid drug plan, which is something we all enjoy today, as well as this notion of Green Shield as a social enterprise, right? A business that exists to solve a social problem. So that was our roots, and we've really just done that for 60-plus years, pay these types of health claims. And now, as you think about where the world is migrating, uh, especially coming out of the pandemic, where our plan members need more than just support around paying their claims. They need support with actually getting health services. So when we're diversifying into this integrated health services company, we're going to be the first insurer to actually start delivering health care services. So during the pandemic, we bought a couple of mental health companies, uh, we're starting to get more active in other health areas of health, both in ownership and partnership. So um, trying to develop this capability to provide the services that we also then administer and pay claims for. So sort of that one-stop shop for our plan members. Wow. So um, the organization started with the idea for people who really just couldn't afford care uh, and along yeah. that spectrum. So we've got exactly. the idea of the, uh, the prescription. But I imagine as you've gone, you've been moving into lots of different areas. If you're just to say, and uh, I know this is a very broad generalization, but could you just give us kind of a, a general profile of who would be a user today? Like what kind of socioeconomic situation would they be in? Like where would be they be living in the country? Anything like that? Yeah, so today we're very narrowly focused on health and dental. So we have two main types of clients. One is an employer. So an employer who offers a, a benefits plan to their employees, chooses an insurance company to manage and pay those claims and take on the risk where they can't afford the risk themselves. Um, so that's one big type of client is that employer, that plan sponsor. So we have a whole bunch of account team people who service that employer. Um, then the end user though is the employee. So uh, with that coverage, they go to you know, the pharmacy or other places I mentioned earlier. And that's part of the business that's called the group business. Then we have the individual business where there's no employer in the picture and the individual directly buys our health and dental products, right? So that they have coverage for prescriptions and other things like that. Uh, the socioeconomic range varies. You know, you go from um, wealthy people who just want that supplemental health coverage and make it convenient for me, um, to then people who, you know, are struggling, but then recognize the importance of being protected for high cost claims and they want a bit of uh, that type of insurance. So we're there for them as well. So okay. it really does vary. You know, and it's interesting to be heading up a company that has this kind of like deep ethical core. That's a massive responsibility. It is. It is. 
And then we're very focused on that too, right? So it's a broad purpose, right? Just improving the health and well-being of Canadians. So we, what we have taken and made it for ourselves is we're focused on improving health in the areas of mental health and oral health, mm. uh, very specifically. And within that, we want to focus on disadvantaged and underserved populations who can't otherwise access care through the Canadian healthcare system. So two signature programs that we have in each of those areas. Um, we just launched something called Room for Her, which is really focused on women's mental health. That's something that's been disproportionately uh, impacted uh, during the pandemic is women's mental health. So we really want to help provide solutions for that. And then we have this oral health initiative called Green Door Project. And that's focused on getting uh, the working poor access to oral health care services. So all the earnings from the business activities that you and I have been talking about go to fund programs like that, which is uh, incredibly inspiring. And that is super cool. So how has the organization stayed on mission this whole time? Because I, I would imagine like that quote unquote mission <laughs> statement would change, but it yeah. sounds like the idea of the organization has stayed the same. How has it maintained that for 65 years? I think that goes, speaks to the culture. So the culture started and, and it's continued uh, to be defined by that social mission at, at, at the very top, right? And that extends not just to the employees, but also to the board and management. It's something that, you know, we recruit for, um, we train for, we do a lot internally to get the employees involved in our social mission. So it's a big part of why GSCers come uh, to work for us and stay. So it's something we've really been able to, to manage quite well. And, um, and that's sort of how it's uh, stayed to We've stayed true to the mission. All right, man. I'm going to push on that, though, because, like, okay. again, I've known you for a long time, yeah. and I've, I've followed you through your career. Yeah. Being part of a purpose-driven company is yeah. kind of a dream for most people. Like, most people want to work somewhere where they're like, I totally believe in what we're doing. Yeah. And more often, actually, I shouldn't say more often than not, I, I have seen quite often that people end up working for organizations where they believe in the mission. Um but there's uh, lots of pressure on uh, the finances. And so they have to do a lot with a little, or there's like very, very poor training for leadership within an organization. So although the intent of the organization and maybe even the impact of the organization in the community is strong, the working conditions are extremely poor. So to be able to like have an organization for 65 years has been really focused on doing like the work of the people that's there for the people and having a strong culture. That is a really tight, uh, it's a really thin, tight rope to walk. And yes. how have you done, or how has the organization done that? Of course, I want to get into, into your space. And the reason I'm asking that, as you know, I've got a long background working in the social services and all purpose driven, uh, impact in the community has been like really good, but time after time, I've seen like really tough work culture, super toxic, like people just yeah. ground down by the machine and it, it's a tough environment to work in. So what you're talking about is actually quite a different and I'd say aspirational and inspirational thing. So how is it, how's the organization address that? So I think it starts with the structure, right? That really is what enables the sustainability of this focus on the social mission. So the fact that we're not for profit. Um, is a big part of it. The fact that we don't have any shareholders, right? So all the publicly traded companies that worked at previously, they also had a purpose and a mission and tried to be very much purpose-led. But as you said, business things would get in the way, quarterly accountability to shareholders would get in the way. We don't have that, so we can focus on the long term. Um, so I think you really feel that when you're inside. So I don't have to, like I did in past lives, uh, be ready to... Uh, meet with analysts every quarter, dis describe what's going well and not in the business. So here we can really think about that aspect. And then, as I said, it really, it's so from the top, it's coming from the structure. The, the board is very aligned with that. So since we don't have shareholders, who are we accountable to? We're actually accountable to the members of the not-for-profit association. There's only about 100 members. Many of them used to be board directors uh, and people very involved with the company. So it's people who work with the company for that reason. Now they're the people we're ultimately accountable to, a very small group. Uh, so they very much hold us accountable to continue to be uh, mission-led. And then finally, the employees. So and I'll give you an example. During the pandemic, um, we were greatly impacted in the beginning. So again, all of our work is around paying these claims. And that first lockdown, all these providers got shut down. So our revenues dropped 40%. And we're like, okay, well, what are we going to do now? Because on top of the revenue drop, we also have an investment portfolio because we have these assets that back the risks in the insurance company. And all the investment value started to drop in the early days of the pandemic too. Um, you know, but rather than panic, what a lot of our employees did was say, well, there's huge needs now in the community. So our team in Windsor 
uh, our big call center team, because there wasn't a lot of calls coming in from our clients, they took their extra time and they staffed a call center uh, in Windsor. It was a food hotline uh, being run by the United Way of Windsor Essex. And they were actually taking calls from people going through food emergencies because they were really struggling during the pandemic, right? So is, is there in the culture, it's at multiple levels, it's sustained by our structure. And that's the only way I can answer sort of how do we actually make that happen uh, on know. a daily basis. I think that's cool, man. It's one of the biggest, like how I actually got into executive coaching is because I, I grew up in the not-for-profit sector. It's my uh, my first three, like, I guess, like grown up jobs, like adult professional jobs were in that uh, area okay. and of the two places of the three places I worked two of them had like toxic horrible cultures and one had a, <laughs> one had a good culture is a very 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 s- small team uh, that had been intact for a long time yeah. and um chronically across all of them it was leadership leadership was terrible it was like and it it wasn't because they're like you know the idea of like good and bad leaders or good and bad people yeah. it can be a bit cartoonish more so it's like they weren't leaders for any other reason than they just happened to be there at the, they were like the last person standing, like everyone else had gotten ground down and pushed out, or they were kind of grand, uh, grandfathered in because they'd, you know, been there and kind of gone up the ranks and they're like, well, you're not really proper for this role, but you've been here forever. So you're in the role. And every one of those situations, you know, it was people who cared about what we're, what they were doing, but they weren't good leaders and the not-for-profit sector that I've seen time and time again, and I'm not saying always, but the not-for-profit sector very often suffers from a lack of strong leadership. And of course the cascade on that is like the, the people in the organization who care so much are just ground down. It sounds like though, that, that green shields be green shields been able to avoid that. We had we've got all these checks and balances, right? So it's not just me or management. There's the board. There's the members who are accountable to. I hear what you're saying though, because I'm on a number of not-for-profit boards, and there's one that I've been on here in Toronto in the child welfare space, and we've gone through a really tough time where there was big allegations of a toxic workforce, um, racism in the workforce, and uh, you know we have a volunteer board. And I'll be honest, I mean, we missed some of that. We just didn't know until it was really far down. Then we took action, right? But um, you need those active checks and balances with people who are interested in what's going on to stop, you know, leadership on its own becoming toxic, I think. So, I mean, that's what the difference I've seen in Green Shield versus some of these other not-for-profits I've been involved with. Well, and do you mind if I press on the not-for-profit space? Yeah, for sure. Because you've also worked in like proper, like corporate environments yeah. that are that are for-profit. Yes. And I, I want to get into your background and talk about that a bit more. Um you brought the discipline of that and kind of like the chops that you brought to that into this space, which is super cool. But based on both of your experiences, leading in the for-profit and now leading in the not-for-profit, if you were just very broadly look at not-for-profit leadership, what are some of the things that you like you would suggest if anyone from a not-for-profit leadership was listening? What are some of the things that you'd be suggesting of like, hey, this is how you like got to shore up your sides. Here's some of the things you need to be thinking about. Yeah, maybe I'll ask that question in a different way because I, we use it, we are technically a not-for-profit, but I try and use the language we're a social enterprise. And the difference to me between a social enterprise and not-for-profit is that we have to generate all the earnings that advance our social mission-based activities, right? Whereas uh, the other not-for-profits that have been involved and they get government grants, they get yes. charitable contributions, right? They're not really generating their own earnings, if you will, right? Yeah. So at Green Show, it's sort of a marriage of the two. So you're absolutely right. You know, we have the discipline around the actual business performance. We're competing against big, big companies like Sun Life, Manulife, who are publicly traded, have all that rigor around it. Um, the, the, the difference just is that instead of returning those dollars to shareholders, we're putting them into the community, right? So it, we have that discipline in our management team. Um, we're even more motivated to have good business performance because that's just more dollars to advance the social mission. And I've just never seen that level of performance accountability at other not-for-profits that have been part of. Um, you know, so I think that's one of the big differences. Okay. You know, so in Vancouver, where I live, um, there is a lot of different organizations who work with, uh, underhoused populations Yeah, and like the people that work in these places, they care, like they're on like front lines, really doing, doing like the work, you know, doing good yeah. work and it's tough, tough, tough. And I think a lot about how can it, how can we reward those people with a good 
structure and a good leadership experience. And I don't blame these not for profits at all. Like I, I, because I've been through it and I got just ground out of it. I couldn't, I couldn't take the, the poor leadership anymore. Like I often think like, how can you get better? And I certainly don't have the answer because it's a complex thing. You, you don't have the money to invest in tons of training and you don't have the, the situation where you can necessarily bring in someone with like a really strong, lengthy background to work in these places because they might not take, take on the role or they might be like, shit, it's too much. I'm always interested in getting the opinion of someone like you of what are some of the things that we can do to create a stronger leadership culture in truly not-for-profits where they are like getting, you know, government grants, they are getting federal or, or provincial grants, they are um, getting donations. Like how can we build up that culture? What are some practical things? And not that you'd have an answer because I am kind of putting yeah. you on the spot about it. <laughs> I think one would be the board. And uh, I, in my experience, having sat on boards for not-for-profit space, it's just a different level of engagement than you get in these corporate boards. So even at Green Shield, where, yes, we're still not for profit. We, we have a board that's very similar to how a board operates um, in the for-profit corporate entities I've been at in the past. It's a skills-based board. Um, we have a lot of relevant experience, both on the social impact side and the business side. And, and you know, it's not just meetings where you get together once a quarter and you, you, you chat or you stay high level. I mean, they dive where they're seeing issues and they're pushing the management team to understand, are there issues and you're just not telling us or are things really going well? And in my experience, we haven't seen that um, in, in the not-for-profit space. And I'd be curious to understand w- where you saw the breakdowns in leadership that you've seen and, and where was the board in that? And, you know, could the board not have done more um, to really direct the leadership team in a better place? I mean, the board is, plays a governance role, not a management role, but where there's toxicity in the workplace or other problems like that, that's when they do need to lean in, I would think. Yeah, I can I can tell you very specifically uh, for the for the two that I saw that were uh, that I had experience in, um, it was up into a middle management position. People were like super in, like really really caring, really understood, and were engaged in like that frontline work. And there was a pretty dis- big disconnect when people got to like that that next level, that more senior level, and it became more about like you know maintaining funding, like making sure there's no like bad press, all of those things. And that disconnect between like middle managers who were still totally living it. And then like the senior leaders, there was this huge gulf here. And of course the middle managers have all of this pressure coming from people that they're leading where it's like, Hey, we need better conditions. We need this. We need that. A lot of those people, most of them, if not all of them are unionized, the middle managers have just taken their step outside of the union. Like now they're no longer part of the union. So they're like, oh no, I used to be you and now I'm over here and yeah. whose side am I on? And I see that pinch of middle management being like disempowered at a senior level because they have a senior level audience who doesn't understand the day-to-day grind, doesn't understand their needs. And then they're pinched between um, frontline employees who are just like so passionate and like care so much. And I think everyone in that in that thing cares. But these, these kind of middle management are stuck between the disconnect at a senior level and then the, the really intense needs of people who are on the front lines. And I just see mid-level managers being like overloaded, um, ground down, leaving, leaving organizations or just kind of trying to avoid things or just doing their, doing their best. It's an unenviable situation to be in, uh, especially because those senior leaders are thinking about writing grant, like writing, writing, try and get funding, like going to meetings, all of those things. There's not like a present really present senior leadership that's really involved. Now that's just the two that I I was in that has toxic culture. I don't say it speaks for everything or for a whole, all organizations, but what I have seen quite often is really intense uh, challenges with leadership and not-for-profits over and over again. I think what you said though about the board is, is, uh, is an interesting thing. So before I go any further on that, um, what did you think about, like when I said though, here's the two things that I saw, is that, is that something that you've recognized in your own experience? It's better, yeah, on this one board in the child welfare space I'm, I'm currently on, it, it, you just basically describe what we went through. And um, it got to the point where because the board was missing what was happening, the unionized workforce um, actually did their own employee survey. And the, the head of the union tried to share that with the board, but the, you know we, we were sort of dismissive of it, uh, more so than we should have been. And uh, they went to the paper. Mm-hmm. And uh, the minute it hit the paper, the government, who's our biggest funder, stepped in and brought in an outside organization to do a full review of the organization. And that's when the board clicked in. And once the board clicked in, so many positive things have happened. Because it wasn't just imp- impacting employees, it was impacting the people that we serve, the vulnerable children. And uh, we hired a new CEO. 
We had to part ways with the previous CEO and COO because of the top two levels of leadership in the organization that was really falling down. That re-engaged uh, middle management, and then we gave a bigger voice to the frontline people who are actually taking care and fulfilling the mission. So it's in such a better place now, a year later, later, because the board has gotten more actively engaged. And what I saw through that process too was, you know, we'd have some of these board meetings, and you know, have two, three board members speak most of the time. After this crisis, the whole board got engaged, united, and it made such a difference. That's why I was questioning the board aspect and in your experience. Yeah, and again, we get people from all sorts of different backgrounds that listen yeah. to this. Um, so we have pure people from like a pure business world, not for profit. Yeah. We have like artists, uh, activists, athletes, people from like the music scene. So if you wouldn't mind, could you explain for the audience, what is the role of a board in, in an organization? Absolutely. So, um, you know, while management runs the business and oversees the operations, you know, someone has to have an eye on management, right? So make sure that um, the governance of the organization is making sense and management is doing the right things relative to strategy. So we're, we're the role of the board is almost like noses in, fingers out. So we're not supposed to take over and direct things, but you're supposed to put your nose in far enough that you know what's happening and you can act when something seems amiss. And that together, those two groups um, should have a shared alignment in terms of advancing the mission of the organization, but the board is the the, the check, uh, the balance check on, on the management team. So they function really well together. And insurance, the area where Greenshield is, uh, our regulator has actually mandated specific duties of the board to make it even clearer because they want clear distinction between management and the board to make sure that both arms function effectively and the organization performs well. So done well, the board can be really important. What's uh, the challenge in the not-for-profit sector is it's all volunteer boards, whereas on the corporate side, they get paid, right? So the, your level of engagement is different based because of the compensation, but if you get the right mission-based folks who care about the work of the organization in the not-for-profit side, I found in my experience that they, they can be almost as effective as uh, you know some of the corporate boards. Yeah, so I've sat on a on two not for profit boards uh, in my time. Um, I just r- wrapped up a stint in a, in my second one, and yeah. uh, it's cool. Like as long as everybody's on board and cares. What I'd say yeah. though is like the, the the unpaid ones, which is what I've done. It's like yeah. it does start to fall into the background. You're like, oh my god, like I have so many other things I have to do, and now <laughs> exactly. I have to do this thing. Um, exactly. Again, for our audience, because I think you can speak to it in a in a way that I get asked about this a lot, but I'd love to hear your take. Why? Yeah. Why is it a good idea or why should people ever consider sitting on a board as they're moving through their career or they're moving through life? I think it's two reasons. One is you, it, you, it allows you to take part in, in some cause, whether that's in the business world or the social impact world that you really care about. So you need to have the right motivation to get on. Um, it's less time intensive. So depending where you are in your career and what other priorities you have, it's very different than your day-to-day managing business or delivering a service, whatever your role is. Um, boards typically meet once a quarter. There's a little bit of interaction between it, but you can participate and stay at that high level. And again, you, you'll have a great impact, right? The boards can have very, very strong impact on the overall success of the organization, the culture of the organization, the strategy of the organization, um, even though they're not diving into the operational details. So I think those are some reasons why, you know, for me at least, uh, sitting on a board has been an important part of uh, trying to balance it with my work responsibilities. Yeah, yeah. All right, let's talk about you specifically. Um, where'd you come up? Where'd you grow up? I grew up, well, so I was born in Pakistan. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, my grandfather, my father's father was uh, Pakistan's ambassador to a few countries, uh, the UK, Russia, and Canada. So when my dad was young, uh, my, my grandfather was actually the ambassador here. So he was stationed here in Ottawa and went to a school at Ashby College in, in Ottawa. So he always had this good impression of Canada. So uh, he eventually moved us out of Pakistan. First, we, we spent a couple of years in England. Then we came to Canada when I was five uh, because of his memory of Canada. And I've been here uh, ever since. Grew up in Montreal. So we immigrated to Montreal. Uh, and then over time, uh, most of, uh, you know, a lot of the jobs moved to, to Toronto. As those people who grew up in Montreal will remember. And uh, I ended up moving to Toronto after I graduated from university. So I did an actuarial science degree. At university, and I've been working as an actuary um, in Toronto since. Although now I'm in more management type roles, but I spent many years working as an actuary in Toronto based on that background. So, what drew you down that path, though? Like, why that yeah. path? Yeah, so I was one of those uh, 
nerdy numbers guys yeah. <laughs> in, uh, in CJEP, which was basically, uh, the, you know, high school, I guess, equivalent, late high school equivalent here in Toronto. And I knew I wanted to do something in math, but I also wanted to make a little bit of money. And, you know, becoming a math professor just didn't pay as well as uh, some of the roles. And I heard about this actuarial science gig where it was actually the year I was thinking about what I wanted to major on in university. It was ranked the number one profession in the jobs almanac based on compensation, based on stress, based on uh, development options. So, okay, well, this sounds like my cup of tea. So uh, I got into that. My best friend at the time had no idea what actually was. He told all of our mutual friends that Zahid was going to become an acupuncturist. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, that's what got me into that line of work. Uh, very cool. Yeah, all right. Yeah. So coming up, how did you end up? At, well, tell us a little bit about your career path from like the first like serious job that you had to yeah. where you led today. Like give us some just resume highlights. For sure. So uh, my first job was uh, as an actuarial assistant at a pension and benefits consulting firm. And then, uh, you know, I worked at a few very different pension and benefits consulting firms and, um, you know, really got out of that, the, the enjoyment of working with clients, um, serving their needs. And then as I got more experience, as it came to serving needs, I wanted to get a bit more involved in management because that could better influence how well we were positioned to really serve the needs of the clients. Uh, then for several years, I sort of had this dual track role where I had both managerial responsibilities and client facing uh, responsibilities, which was great because you can't do one without the other. You can't really run a business well if you don't understand who your clients are and what totally. their needs are and have that client focus, right? So I was very fortunate to, for many, many years to have the benefit of both. And then, you know, just as I continued to progress, gravitate a bit more to the managerial side. And then uh, Green Show was my first foray into the insurance world. So all my time in the benefits industry before Green Show was on this consulting and HR services side. So um, came here somewhat adjacent space, but different and entirely now a managerial role uh, versus that sort of hybrid role I've had for most of my career before Green Shield. Yeah. So when was your first leadership gig? Like your first position where you actually like had reports and you were leading people? Yeah, so that would be the one in my late 20s where I was uh, responsible for building and then running an admin business. So we started from scratch. We built our own benefits admin platform. We licensed a pension one, built a team up. It was, um, you know, over 100 people uh, by the time I moved on to my next role. So uh, and to have that opportunity in your late 20s, I, I would not have had that without this mentor. Like he took a chance on me, um, supported me, mentored me, guided me while I was in the role. Uh, you know, basic things at, at that point where I was not comfortable with public speaking at all, didn't have the confidence in how to manage groups of people because I was a large and individual uh, contributor uh, and client facing person before that. So he took that time, invested in me and uh, that's how I got successful and it went from there. Okay. Put yourself back in that role. Like now, yeah. like just like go right back there now. Yeah. What are some of the things that you learned about yourself when yeah. you were like year one as a leader? Like what's some of the good stuff you learned and some of the challenging stuff you learned? Oh man, I learned so many things about myself. Right? So I learned the importance of effective communication uh, because I sucked at it. <laughs> so I saw like some how, how did you suck at it specifically? Like what was the problem? Oh, I'll give you one example. So my first uh, sort of town hall with the group and then uh, the, the head of Canada came with me. We, we did it at a pool hall, right? To somewhere casual to have some fun, to celebrate some successes and I was trying to get them talking. So imagine, it's already tough, right? You're in a, in a bar, people are drinking, they're playing pool, and you're trying to get their attention for a little bit, right? I could not get the room. Uh, I couldn't get the room at all. So then the, 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 my mentor came in, and within five seconds, he had the room, mm -hmm. right? So just how you uh, gain people's interest, and those things are so important because that's how you build followership, how do you speak to them, how do you communicate to them. So... Um, that was something I was really, really bad at initially was communicating and, and leading large teams through effective communication. And then you got some of the softer side stuff, right? So with my training as an actor, I had all the technical skills and the knowledge of what we we're trying to do. And with the client experience before that, I knew what the clients wanted, right? But then, you know, the authenticity, the empathy, um, some of those skills, I think those skills, it took me probably a good 10, 15 more years to learn. That's one thing I've seen be much more prominent in business the last five to 10 years, even more so during the pandemic, is some of those softer skills, right? Empathy and authenticity in particular, you cannot lead effectively now without those. And I, in retrospect, I think that was a real shortcoming on my, my end in my early days of leading teams. Well, how did you learn them though? So like something like 
being authentic or, yeah. or empathy. Like when we say them, like yeah. they, they make logical sense in our head, but what they mean in practicalities is like totally different. So how did you actually learn that stuff? Watching others was a big part of it, right? So I had the opportunity to work with and for a number of leaders, some of whom were very, very strong in that perspective. They really led uh, with that people focus. The business became afterwards. So again, this, this mentor of mine, he had this wonderful formula for business success. Happy people plus happy clients will bring for you the happy results, right? Where so many business leaders are financial and performance focused. They start there. But this guy said, you do those first two things well, it'll take care of itself. And the way he treated people, uh, the way he supported people, even the story with me, right? He didn't have to do what he did with me, uh, but he, he, he did it authentically. He authentically wanted to see me succeed. And at no point do I think he had any other reason for, for doing that. So just working with people, learning through osmosis. I also had the opportunity to do a few leadership development programs over the course of my career. Probably the most impactful one was back in 2015, I had an opportunity to go spend two months living on campus at Harvard Business School in their advanced management program. And, and it's all about leadership track. And they give you a heavy dose of soft skills and leadership. And they actually had senior leaders come in and talk to you about how some of those softer traits help them be better leaders. So really compelling case studies and storytelling from those folks who resonated with me. That's probably the biggest thing I took away from that experience and I tried to be much more diligent about doing that. Mm-hmm. I'm probably still not as good as I need to be, but uh, something I always keep top of mind is getting stronger with some of the soft skills like those. Something that stands out to me as you're talking, and I can also I can hear it in your voice and see it on your face, yeah. like mentorship made a big difference to you in your Did. life. Yeah. So... And also what I'm hearing is you surrounded yourself with people that you wanted to observe. Like there weren't people where you're like, oh God, I don't want to pay attention to this person. They're terrible. Like you're like, yes. whoa, wow, that person does it in an interesting way. So you're you're around people that at least inspired or captured your attention and you yep. learned from them. Yep. Absolutely. Talk, talk to us about that, that importance of mentorship and surrounding yourself by people who are like uh, who at least inspire your attention. Yeah, I think, I think it takes two things uh, to really work. So I knew er, relatively early on, sort of mid-20s, what, uh, where sort of the career path I wanted to go down. I think a lot of folks that they don't know, and then it becomes really hard to find a mentor who can really help you if you yourself don't really know what you want to do and more importantly, why uh, you want to do that, right? So I had this notion of, look, I want to be client-facing and help clients solve their problems. And I want to have a role in running the business so that I can impact how clients are served. And I was very, because of that, I was able to uh, find two critical mentors. I've talked to you about the one who really mentored me in the business side. I was fortunate enough at the same company to find uh, someone who really mentored me on the client side. Um, but because I sort of was very specific that that's where I wanted to grow, that helped me engage my mentors in a way that you know, I got a lot out of the relationship and I tried to do that as well. And the first thing I asked someone who sort of reaches out to me for help or mentoring is, so what do you want to do and why? Right. And if they can't answer those questions, I make them pause and think about it. Right. Because there's no point just providing general advice and thoughts uh, that it starts with that person understanding the journey they want support mm-hmm. for. Um one of the things that I, I say a lot, not just in, in coaching, but just in general, is yeah. if you want to do something, surround yourself with people who have been successful at it already. Yeah. And I don't mean like if you podcast, go and find like some <laughs> super high level podcaster, but more so like as an example, I, I have a, a young daughter, she's three and a half. And I have um, my fr- my friends who are parents since I've had a kid, I've like put a lot more effort into getting to like spend time with them, know them, but also learn from them. Like people who are like really good parents, I'm super interested in learning from. I ask a lot of questions. I'm very like, I I pay a lot of attention to what they do and how they manage things. People who are good business leaders, like I spend a lot of time talking to people who are business leaders, not as like me coaching them, but just learning from them or just being in their, in their company. And even just being in the company of people who are successful and what I, whatever I'm trying to do is always like, you just kind of get that like energy from them, that shine from them, the discipline, you just pick up tips. So it's not like I'm constantly interviewing people, but I spend time around them. And when I say successful, I don't mean like financially successful, just whoever's good at doing what they're doing. I want to know and understand and spend time with. Um, It's about developing like a, a peer group. It's about having mentorship. And one of the things that I, I 
I really deeply suggest for people in whatever they're doing, if you're at the start or middle, middle, or even if you're far into your journey, but you want to get to a next, uh, the next iteration of what you could do, spend time with people who are really already good at it. And it will be a game changer. Absolutely. And I love what you said there is, is the definition of success can vary, right? It's not always the traditional or if you're in business financially focused. Um, but I'm beyond intrigued by people who are successful at attracting other people, right? And, and, and then helping them succeed. Um, so that's one way I sort of define success when I look at leaders today and really want to understand and learn how did you create that kind of success? How did you get good at that? And what drives you to continue to be good at that? So I think you're spot on. Um, so if you think back to that early time when you were still yeah. learning, yeah. what are some lessons that you learned there that you, or what's like, what's something you've learned there that you could share with other people who are younger in their, in their uh, leadership? Yep. Maybe people who are first time managers or just going down that path or even just thinking about stepping into that leadership space. You know, and I've, I've talked to young actuarial students about this a lot. Um, and maybe I'll answer very specifically in that narrow area. Mm -hmm. um, just because it's been something that I've talked a lot about was we're trained to be highly technical, right? So our education is mathematics, statistics, um, operations, research, all, all these highly technical roles. And then you computers, you come out and you're technically sound, right? And you can see problems and solution to problems probably better than most because of that training. We, we are people disasters though, right? <laughs> Just disasters. <laughs> so I said, you know, think about what you want to do. And if you want to eventually be managing people, uh, running businesses, you've got to get some of those other skills. So I mm -hmm. would encourage people to really work on their public speaking right from the get-go, like Toastmasters, whatever it is, get out there. Take risks. Put yourself out there. It doesn't matter if you fail early on because that it's through the, those failures that some of my business, my biggest learnings came Right. So it's taking those risks, which again, actors are taught how to avoid risk, right? Or manage risk, not take risks. So yeah. it's putting yourself outside your comfort zone is uh, some of the biggest things I push uh, the, the young folks who ask me for advice early yeah. on. I love that. And, you know, I hear this, I, I work with a lot of engineers and my company works with a lot of engineers and I hear that all the time. It's like, <laughs> man, give me an engineering problem all over, all over it. Give me like a yeah. basic person <laughs> challenge and I don't know what to do. Exactly. And, you know, you don't have to be good at everything. Very few people yeah. go to school to be leaders, exactly. but a lot of people who are experts in their field end up being leaders. And it's yeah. the same thing you might see in the not-for-profit space where it's like, hey, great intentions. You're really good at your job. And now your job is actually something totally different. How do you transition? So mentorship, focusing on your communication skills, like going out and actually intentionally learning soft skills, like yeah. how to how to make leadership authentic for you, how to um, uh, really be with people in an empathetic way. Those yeah. are things that most people have to go out and learn. And there, you know, there's courses, there's coaching, yeah, yeah. there's all sorts of things. All right, let's go to the next chapter. So um, you have your first leadership experience. Then yeah. what's next for you after that? Um, just continued growth. Um, mm -hmm. you know, so when I ran that administration business, then I got the opportunity to become the chief operating officer for Canada again in my early thirties. Um, so got a much broader uh, sense of the business. We were a global company. So in that role, I also got the opportunity to be much more involved in some key global issues, uh, strategic planning and things like that. Um, large clients as well. Uh, cause many of the clients of that organization were actually parents, had parents in the U.S. Um, so just, you know, expansion of some of the opportunities that I had in one area, just at a much, much bigger uh, perspective now. Then that company got acquired and the whole company, whole culture changed. And uh, so that was a big change for me, right? To, to, to totally switch after that point. Um, but that, again, took me out of my comfort zone, right? To reprove myself to people who didn't know me. I sort of joined the organization at a more senior level versus having grown up through the organization, right? So how you build credibility early on. Um, so I think my leadership journey got some of those new flavors just by the virtue of changing companies, even though it's still within the same industry. So you had to like make your bones again, basically. You did, exactly. And how was that for you? You know, I, I was fairly, uh, I thought I did it fairly well. Um, I didn't enjoy the company I went to though. Yeah. So uh, I didn't even last two years. And then I changed again. Uh, and that's when I moved to uh, the country where you and I met. Um, and then you know, it was there for over 10 years. But so less than two years later, again, I had to 
prove my bones one more time, right? Yeah. But uh, that is partly how you build followership, right? By, by coming in and building credibility with people who don't know you, by understanding them. So it forced me to sort of use some different muscles that I never had to use when I was just growing up in an organization, things were much more familiar. Yeah, the way that I, I like to think about that, like having to move uh, to a new organization where you've had a lot of success somewhere else yeah. and you move somewhere else and you have to like, you know, earn it again. Exactly. The way I like to think about it is the way I think about triathlons. And, yeah. you know, I like running. I like cycling. I hate swimming, but I, I like running. I like cycling and swimming, whatever. But yeah. what I like about triathlons is that like you actually have to be good at all three of them or at least right. decent at two of them and somewhat okay at the other one. Yeah. Yeah. And each one is different enough and is like unique enough that like by mastering or getting decent at all three, you actually become like quite a bit, quite a bit of a better athlete. Like you're quite strong at doing stuff and to train for all the, those three things, you got to kind of do different things, strengthen different parts of your body. Like you got to, you basically have to like round yourself out as an athlete. And Pretty. I like, let's say a running race, just a running race. It's fun. And I like a bike race. I don't like a swimming race and I'll never just do one of those, but I, I do like these things, but I love a triathlon because there's so much thoughtfulness that goes into that preparation of it. And the idea of moving from one company where you've been really, really successful, but then going to another company, especially if your company has been acquired and you're at a senior level, now you're mm -hmm. actually not at that same role. You're in a different role, yeah. earning your way up it trains you up in a different way where you've been successful before you might not be successful in that same way. It might take different skills. You might have to learn to, well, you certainly will have to learn and try different things. And I think that's really healthy for, um, uh, for any professional, just the same way that it's healthy for an athlete to like learn and master different kinds of sports. Well said, I think it's a great analogy. And then it's that general management thing too, right? So the triathlon, you got to be very good in three disciplines as opposed to, world class in just one and uh, that's sort of what it's like to be as a leader right and that, that this Harvard program I was telling you about really focus on that general management and then it's the interdependencies between the various different types of streams that's really what makes you most effective yeah all right but then we make the leap to yeah. where you're at now yeah so this is your first time as a CEO yes absolutely okay were there any hesitations any fear or were you like I'm all in I felt at this point I was ready okay. uh, when I made this jump and it was in a space that, again, while it was somewhat different than where I grew up in, it was adjacent enough that I felt confident enough. Um, the interviews to for the role with the board, I mean, they got pretty specific. They wanted to get your thoughts on what strategy would you implement to advance the business and it seemed to really resonate. It was an easy conversation or just affirm it. Okay, yes, I can do this. I'm ready. And uh, so no, no hesitation from, from a readiness perspective. I, was, right. what, I wanted this opportunity. What's the biggest thing you've learned about yourself since you've taken on this role? I, I think I've learned that. So this role in terms of what was required was quite different than what I've done in the past. So in the past, you know, I, I, I've had to build businesses. I've had to turn around businesses. I've had to reinvent uh, failing businesses. Here, it was a sort of green flag. I'm joining a highly successful company, right? That's been in business for 60 plus years. That's the fourth biggest in its space, but um, the board is worried about the headwinds that it's one line of business faces and says, well, we need to diversify um, and diversify in a way that both protects the core business, but also moves us into higher growth, uh, new markets. So that's a completely different mandate than I had to do before, right? There was a bit of a doubt in me like, okay, can I actually do this? Because I haven't actually had to do this specific thing before. And uh, so, so I've learned that I can, and I've learned that to do it well, it's really took the whole team, right? So not just the executive team and the broader leadership team, but the whole organization um, has helped come along in this journey of where we're headed. And, uh, you know, I've learned that I can do that and I need this broader community because um, that was what's going to drive our success together. All right. So what are you still working on as a CEO, you yourself personally? What are you trying to get better at? Oh, oh, lots of stuff. Like to me, every interaction is a learning opportunity, right? So, I mean, every time you and I connect, I, I learn stuff and I take it away. Um, so specifically what I'm learning, I'm trying to learn right now is, is, is so I've, I've been on boards of not-for-profits before, but really this, this notion of, okay, we're going to generate these earnings, which I, I know how to do, but we're going to then use them to advance our social mission. So that's um, an area I've tried to spend a bit more time on now. So as we try to carve out a greater voice, 
for Green Shield and influencing public policy in oral health and mental health. What's the best way to go about doing that, right? How do you influence uh, government, other uh, key stakeholders who are needed to really improve the well-being in those specific areas? So that's really what I'm trying to work on now is really to have the kind of social impact that we're hoping to. Um, how do you go about doing that? We're trying to change as well sort of how the general not-for-profit space operates. So when we fund uh, other organizations who are going to do good work in oral health and mental health, we're trying to hold them more accountable now uh, because we actually want, we don't want to just be a funder. We want to drive social impact. So we've actually come up with a measurement framework around impact and we're trying to get, hold our uh, the charities who receive dollars from us accountable for that, but then also focus on measuring that. We think that'll make them better as well and sort of making sure that our dollars are being used Accordingly, but there's, there's a change in that area, and uh, we've been working a lot with community foundations. That's a big part of our partnership model to advance social impact priorities. So, getting to know the space, how they think, um, how to influence change in them based on what we're look, looking to accomplish. All these things uh, are new, and that's uh, some of the things I've been trying to invest my time in and learn from. So, you spent the majority of your career as a as a leader, like actually leading people. Yeah. No, I guess now, now that the age I'm at, I think that is yeah. true. Yes. <laughs> You've hit the tipping point where it's the majority of your career. Yes. Yeah. What, if any difference is there? Cause this is the first time that you've like been at the head of the, like the head of the yeah. organization. What, if any difference is there of leading a C-suite team versus leading like any other, any other uh, type of team that you've led before? Yeah. I think the uh, expectations and stakes are higher. Right. So one thing that's been that's very different for me in this role, in the previous role, is just my involvement with the board of directors. I mean, I, I would meet with the boards uh, at other organizations before, even one in the executive team, right? But to now interact with the board as CEO level is very different. You know, you've got to manage their stakeholders. I joke, right? People often aspire to become a CEO because then they think they're the boss. Right. Uh, the bad news is when you become a CEO, you actually have 12 bosses because those are the number of board directors that are most common. <laughs> Right. So how do you navigate a group of people uh, who have very different skill sets, experiences, perspectives uh, down a common path? And then, you know, then interacting with the executive team, you've got to let go a bit more. Right. You really got to trust them to run their business because your attention is split across the board, external stakeholders. You don't have as much time to be as hands on in the business. So that's also been a learning for me to sort of elevate myself a little bit more and giving uh, my executive team members, the space they need and deserve to, to grow and succeed in their roles. Uh, would you mind if I, if I give you a philosophy of leadership that I have? Yeah, I'd love to hear it. Um, so when people talk about coaching, they talk about yeah. it in kind of general terms, like, oh, we're going to coach, we're going to coach this person. And I, I look at it as like a very specific discipline. So instruction is like showing someone how to do something. You tell them how to do it, then you have them like execute on it, do it, and then you give them feedback so they get better and better and better. So instruction is about uh, demonstrating something and then getting people to get better at it through an iterative process, a, re- a process of repetition. Yeah. Influencing is just influencing someone's thinking, right? It, you're not showing someone how to do something, you're showing someone how to think about something. Um, so you're challenging their thinking, you're like holding a mirror to the thought process. Coaching is in the middle where it can be instructing, and it can be, it, well, it should be instructing and influencing thinking. So I'd say like a driving instructor, yeah. if, like a proper driving instructor would actually be a coach because you're showing someone the mechanics of how to like drive, like how to merge, you know, like how to long to stop at a stop shot. So you're watching their technique and you're getting them to do it, but you're also influencing how they think about driving. Like something like if someone cuts you off, they didn't do something to you. Very likely they didn't do something to you intentionally. It feels personal, but if you have like a wider worldview, you can look at it as being like, well, maybe that person just spilt a drink in their lap or maybe they're in an emergency or maybe they're having a bad day or maybe they just didn't notice. And that idea of how to get someone to think about becoming a good citizen of the road, that's influencing, but showing someone how to drive, that's instruction and that merging point is coaching. Yes. So- what I find is that uh, up until around like mid-level, like early leadership is more like 80, 20, kind of like you're doing more instruction and 20% influencing thinking. So you're showing people. And when you get to like a mid-level of uh, management, it gets like a little bit more 50-50. Like you're actually still showing people how to do stuff, but you're just doing a ton of coaching. And then when I find, or sorry, a ton of influence, so it's more like kind yeah. of pure coaching. 
when you get to the more senior levels, I find it's much more about influencing p- thinking. You're rarely instructing people what to do. You're kind of challenging their thinking. You're in that space of like trying to get the best out of them without putting your fingers too much into it. So if you were to give like a very basic idea, so like, you know, and just general ratios of, of like in how much instruction versus how, versus how much influencing do you do with your executives right now? What would it be? Yeah, that's a great question. I think what you say really rings true to me. I think I've seen that pendulum shift over time as you um, go to more senior roles, probably because it has to, you just don't have the time to spend too much time instructing. It's more the influencing. At Greenshaw, I think it's a myth. It's a mix, right? So I think in the core business, do that 80-20 uh, rule that you talked about. But then if you look at what we're trying to actually accomplish, right, the shift from being a health and dental insurer to this integrated health services organization, there's a lot of specifics around how we're going to go about doing that successfully, right? So I think because of the transformation phase that we're in, I'm probably not at the 80-20 overall. I'm probably more 50-50, to be honest, mm. yeah. on the instruction versus influencing. And, yeah. but, but I think it's not sustainable. It won't be like that for the long term, but just as we're migrating through this change, uh, I think I have to be a bit more hands-on in that in that way. Totally. And hopefully, like- but hopefully I'm doing it in a way that it's not offensive right, to my team. Right, that they feel that they're still learning either way, right? Even if it's more an instruction base, that they still feel that they're learning and growing themselves, because um, we want that to happen through the journey as well. Well, totally. And like the the reason I I put it in these terms, so like sometimes someone's just doing pure instruction, like you're just showing someone how to do something. Other times you're doing just pure influencing. You're just trying to get someone to think of anything uh, of something else. But anytime that you're doing any level of both, even if you're yeah. doing like two percent instruction and the rest is influencing, or if you're doing like 95% instructing, but you're also trying to get them think different ways, then you're entering into the realm of coaching. And most levels of leadership have some kind of coaching, but really knowing when to lean more into into one and when to lean more into the other. And then other times when you're not really coaching, you're only influencing or you're only instructing or only influencing. It's good to understand what you're doing because you do it with purpose. And what you just said there, it's like, I'm sure it's landing well because there's times you have to do 50-50. So as I've been growing uh, my business, I've been changing my ratios and I changed my ratios on what I do based on who I'm working with, what we're working on. There's some conversations where I'm going to be doing very little instruction and way more influencing. Others will be doing a lot of instruction, very little influencing. Businesses that are like scaling up, growing, taking on different models are going to require leaders at all sorts of different levels to be very flexible, but to also know what they're doing and when, rather than just saying like, I'm coaching, be like, this is the kind of coaching I'm right now. And here's kind of the ratio I should be at. And do you find your personal attributes sometimes influence what that ratio is? So I'm an impatient person uh, naturally, right? I sometimes find... And I've got to stop myself. I'm going to find someone's not doing something the way I think it should be done. It's probably being one of my historic weaknesses. Then I'll just dive in and do it. All right. And that's where it's sort of even the instruction part is, starts to become ineffective if you start just, just doing it and expecting them to learn by watching you do. How is that something that you've seen? How do you sort of watch for that, overcome that? Well, one of the things I ask people to do is like, so know yourself truly. So yeah. you know you're impatient. Yeah. I know I can be passive aggressive. Like, so being passive aggressive is something I've really worked on a lot. Okay. And my deep preference is I don't like instructing people because just because I do it a certain way doesn't mean it's the best way to, for it to be done. Mm-hmm. And typically I like people to figure out how they want to do something and then I'll give them feedback on it and we'll talk about it. And they're, then I'll do some instruction to kind of help them like iterate a bit, like to get to a better yeah. place. But I know if I start just doing something for someone, that I'm likely being passive aggressive and that if I'm being passive aggressive, what it means is I'm avoiding a conversation that I don't want to have with them. And and in that conversation, I might end up being wrong. They might be like, you're way off. Your your expectation is wrong. When I'm being passive aggressive, it's a sense of frustration and frustration for me comes from avoidance. And like, I don't have an avoidant leadership style, but because I like to give people space and, you know, just like any leader, I'm moving a million miles an hour. I have to like catch myself around passive aggressiveness and always passive aggressiveness. Almost always is me starts by me just doing something rather than being in that instruct, being in a true coaching space. What a great point. So first, I think I've probably learned that in addition to being impatient, I might be a bit passive aggressive. But then <laughs> what, what, what you also said that resonated um, was this notion of, oh no, I've lost it. That was what you said beyond just the passive aggressiveness. Avoidant. Yes, that's it. Because you're avoiding confrontation. That is absolutely it. And I think that's been a weakness of mine 
that I'm actively trying to get better on is, is I don't like to have a uh, confrontational type situation. Like I'll give the feedback, but sometimes, you know, you have to go back and reinforce and continue to coach. Like I, I don't, as much as possible, I prefer to avoid conflict. I'm getting better at that now because I think it's helpful to the person if you in a, do it in a respectful way, but it helps them grow and develop, but it doesn't come naturally to me uh, doing that. Oh, totally. I Yeah. So one of the things I struggle with is, or I have struggled with traditionally is I've always been uh, super passionate about whatever I do, which is cool. Like it's totally yeah. cool. But I got a piece of feedback when I was younger in, in two ways. One was in the workplace. And then one was like, you know, I grew up playing in, in punk bands and uh, in the workplace, it was like, Hey, not everyone is as comfortable with you as you are with having tough conversations. So I'd always want to have like whatever tough conversation, like let's have a tough conversation. And I didn't realize that it was like, God, this guy wants to have tough conversations all the time. Like, just <laughs> chill out over there. Not everything needs to be discussed. Exactly. But then when I was playing in a band, um, the feedback was, it's like, Hey man, like, you know, whatever you think needs to be discussed, like we're stuck in a van together for six weeks at a time. Like, like basically like shut up, <laughs> let's just have fun. And I had to really learn how to like not indulge my desire to solve everything and have everything on the table and have the conversations. Yeah. And in doing that, I ended up becoming quite avoidant of conflict because I'm super comfortable in a tough conversation. I'm trained on how to do it because yeah. of my background. Yeah. I can be in like a tough, tough, tough conversation. But what I was doing was forcing situations as people who maybe didn't think there was an issue or people who were just not ready to do it. So I went too far and then I've become like avoidant of being in those spaces because I don't want to put people in tough spots. And really right. what the magic has been for me is learning how for each person I can have the right conversation at the right time and also make myself do it and be like, no, if you're being passive aggressive, it's means because you've skipped a step. And I've had to really, really learn that. Mm -hmm. And how I've learned that is by building up cadence. Like when I was at my last job, I was still kind of like, let's have a tough conversation. It's like, yeah. I hadn't learned anything. Like I was still <laughs> doing that thing. Building up the company has been such a good thing to hold up a mirror because at the end of the day, if the company fails, but yeah. if a company fails financially, it's like, hey, maybe we didn't have the right formula. Maybe the market right. went soft, whatever it was. But yeah. if it fails from a culture or leadership perspective, it is my fault because the company's too small for it to be anyone else's fault. So I have yeah. to hold up a mirror and I have to really learn to myself. So that's something I've been really working on is that how do you have the right tough conversation at the right time in the right way for the right person? And if I, and I know I'm not doing it if I'm being passive aggressive. Well said, it's a great insight. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I, I think it's important for leaders, especially like, so using myself as an example, great. I'm doing a podcast about leadership. Doesn't mean I know, like, what do I know? You know, like I only know what I know from my experience and working with people like you, I don't know it at all. And part of it is that I talk to people like you cause I want to learn. Right. Exactly. That's why I enjoy these conversations too. There's learning in every one of them. Yeah. Okay. So let's go into the organization. Yeah. You know, you take on your role, you got a couple years and then COVID. Yes. <laughs> what did you do? How did you handle it? Yeah. So I think as I was saying earlier, so the beginning period of COVID was terrifying, right? Because our revenues dropped, our, our volumes dropped. And we're like, well, what are we going to do? And this was new to all of us. It was new to the board. So and how long will this last? How sustainable will it be? All these questions start going through your mind, right? Uh, so we sort of stepped back and took a moment and said, you know, end of the day, the pandemic is a health issue. It's causing all these economic issues and uncertainties, but it's first and foremost a health issue. Um, so we need to do the right thing and we need to put the health and safety of our employees first. And I think that was just a very important decision that then guided how we were going to operate, right? Because the first five days or so were like, oh my God, oh my God, there's a sort of chaos going on, right? Yeah. And that just settled things down because once we made that decision, you know, then the next set of decisions, they flowed quickly. So, um, you know, we, we have a unionized workforce uh, who's anxious, what does this mean for their job? So right off the bat, we said no layoffs or workforce reduction in the pandemic because this is a health crisis. We won't do that. Second thing we said is no salary reductions. And we said, uh, even though we had no idea if we could actually do it, we said we're going to get as many people working from home as quickly as possible. So, 
you know, within 10 days, less than 10 days, we had 98% of our folks working from home. If you had asked me before the pandemic, is that possible? We all would have said, hell no. But, you know, we, we made it work and, and we sustained it for two years and client service levels never really dipped. So, um, but all that stemmed from that first decision, putting health and safety of our employees first. Then as things continued, then we started shifting our focus beyond uh, the employees. We looked, okay, social enterprise, how do we help the communities? I mentioned the support that we did of the uh, food hotline in, in Windsor. We also contributed to many other causes. Equity seeking groups were really disproportionately impacted during the pandemic. So we steered a lot of our giving towards indigenous BIPOC, other populations who are really feeling impact. Um, so try to be there for our communities in times of need. And then finally as well for our clients. So while our revenues and claims are dropping, they're still paying premiums at the same old level as if the same amount of claims are happening. And many of these are small businesses who just needed every dollar they could to sustain their business. So uh, the whole industry gave uh, some level of premium refund, but we, we proudly uh, led the industry in the amount of premium refunds we gave, a lot of them which went to small businesses and really helped them uh, navigate their businesses through the pandemic. So really thought about our stakeholders uh, during the time. And then things stabilized for us, right? The first lockdown lifted, uh, volumes came back, not to full pre-pandemic levels, but enough that we were comfortable. Uh, the market turned around from an investment portfolio perspective as the government started to put in uh, all their investment dollars. So things were good. And then we wanted to calm our folks down instead of making the focus be COVID, COVID, COVID. So, okay, well, we're in a different environment. You know, we're probably never going to go back to the same normal, but let's do what we're here to, right? It's a serve our communities, run the business to fund how we serve the communities. And, and we try to focus people on what they're doing. I think that assured them. And then we even did a few acquisitions. We had not done any acquisitions in our entire history. Now we've done four during the pandemic, right? So we kept the eye moving forward. We're still on this journey and we'll get through this. So that's how we've navigated. A lot of people use the pandemic to try new things. So there you go. Yeah, exactly. Um, all right. How how did you tend to the the mental health of the organization, though? Because as we know, like that has been a huge challenge for businesses. And some of them have totally done a great and incredible job. And others have just struggled. And, and not because they didn't care, but because mental health has been something... Mental health and uh, and I, I I'm going to want to circle back on uh, to, with this with you as well as diversity, equity, and inclusion. These are yes. two things that companies have traditionally talked a lot about, exactly. and then in the background have been like, I don't know, we're really going to yeah, do yeah. with this, yeah. and suddenly they're like, Oh no, we have to do something. So what did you do to tend to the mental health of your organization? Yeah, that was a critical question for us, a uh, big part because of who we are, right? So mental health is one of our two areas of focus for social impact. I said as part of our business strategy, we wanted to get into the business of delivering mental health care, right? So we absolutely w- w- would not accept being the shoemaker's kids who didn't have any shoes on the mental yeah. health front, right? So yeah. uh, we tried, we added a lot of mental health supports. We made um, certain services available for free to our employees mm. in the pandemic, like ICBT, the cognitive behavioral therapy services, uh, additional counseling support beyond the EAP program we provided. Uh, we increased the, the benefit available to any mental health service in our in our plan uh, to $2,000 per employee. The average the median company in Canada provides $750, so well above the typical investment. All, and then we would regularly check in with our employees, right? Uh, whether through surveys or other forms of interactions, you know, how are you doing? How can we help train our managers to identify uh, mental health issues on their team as early as possible? So a lot of investment and focus in that area. And it's not something that you can resolve like this, right? So we've had a sustained focus on it throughout the pandemic. And even if you think about our future hybrid workforce model, we're designing in a way that we want to put much more focus on mental health. Because even once the pandemic's over, mental health issues will continue uh, to increase and, and, and be of concern. You think about if we're going to spend a lot more time permanently working from home, what do you do about young people who live on their own, other groups who find it, find the isolation very stressful and uh, get a lot of anxiety from it. So how do we put in supports as an employer uh, for some of those or what we're thinking through now for the next stage of the journey that we're planning? Yeah. Uh, so I love, I love to hear that. Why do you think it's taken a crisis like this to get businesses to genuinely invest in men- mental health? Because 
again, I've heard businesses talk a big game about it for years. And a lot of it is like, I, I, I know it comes from the heart, but a lot of it has kind of been like marketing points. Like we care about the mental health and suddenly it's like, oh no, like we actually have to do something. Why is it taking a crisis to create this level of investment and change? Okay. So yeah, now, now we're going to get into it. Yeah. <laughs> so at first, I think we, we got to start talking about the government first. Right? Because if I'm an employer, what's my role in delivery of healthcare if I'm in a publicly funded healthcare system, right? And if you look at the support that the, the government has provided for mental health, it has lagged other OECD countries for years. So about seven before the pandemic, about seven percent of our spend went to mental health. Other countries were like 11, 12 percent. So the question is why? Why so little? Um, and then what you started to see to fill this vacuum is that even before the pandemic, some employers were starting to invest more dollars in mental health programs. A lot of it was spurred on by the great work that Bell did, so they let's talk to help remove the stigma. And then employers started to invest in some of these programs to support mental health. So I actually feel like employers were doing stuff before. The focus was more on the stigma removal than the care. Yes, and what we yes. Saw happen, what we saw happen during the pandemic was then everyone shifted, okay, we need to focus on care because mental health issues are happening at a way faster clip than the before the pandemic. And that's really where employers started to do stuff. The government started to invest more. So our spend on mental health in the general healthcare system went from 7% to 9%. So things are happening. We're making progress. Um, the $750 median uh, benefits dollars available for mental health I mentioned earlier, that was like three, $400 before the pandemic. So we are seeing increase. We are seeing more focus from employers on this. And why is that happening? I think the employees are demanding it, right? When, when it's a pretty competitive job market out there right now, as I'm sure you know. Uh, and, and part of the decision making is who will support my mental health as, as part of my employee employer relationship. So I think that's part of what's uh, pushing employers to do more. But at the same time, governments can. And it's good to see that they are now doing more as well. It's an interesting thing. I love what you said about remo- the idea of re- removing stigma versus actually like providing services for people. Yeah. And like, it's not like you're going to like bring therapists in and be like, everybody, let's do a yeah. counseling session. Like, <laughs> exactly. I, I totally get it. Uh, but as an example, our side, uh, like the side of our business that is focused on providing like kind of practical mental health strategies for companies, yeah. it just blew through the roof uh, in the organization or, 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 or during this pandemic. And before that, it was like, if I said, it was like, hey, listen, like we, we do a lot of work with people on emotional labor or long-term stress response or managing your energy from like a, like your physical and emotional energy, um, you know, any of, any of that kind of stuff, like a, what we call positive vulnerability. Before, if I was like recommending this to organizations, it'd be like, yeah, but like we kind of want to focus more on either executive coaching or we want to focus on training, like let's do presentation training, which is cool. Like th- those are... Our business is broken into like uh, coaching for for individuals and teams, um, corporate training, and then like kind of more like mental health uh, care stuff. The other two were pumping along really great, but I could very rarely get a leader to focus on this thing because they'd always go to the stigma conversation. Oh, we got we got to remove that stigma. We got to remove that stigma. It's like yeah, that, that that's cool, but I kind of feel largely that mission is quite well underway in our society. It's not there yet. There's lots more work to do, but it's underway. But the offering effective services, especially like normalizing it, that there's actually effective trainings within a company, it just wasn't there. Okay, two years in, it's one of the biggest parts of our business, which has been super cool. And we're coming hopefully to the end of this this pandemic now. How do we keep that going? How does it be like, oh, well, listen, it's just, that's just another line in our budget that we can like reduce or get rid of. Let's like move that money somewhere else. Like, how do we keep it going so that we can make sure people are getting proper services and proper trainings? Yeah, it's a great question. And even the, the, the name that you use for that program, positive vulnerability, just think about that before the stigma was started to be lifted. That's an oxymoron, right? There's nothing positive about being vulnerable. So I can't imagine why anyone would even <laughs> think of using that service well, the stigma was still there, right? <laughs> but totally. we have to, what, what I say a lot is, is the pandemic has brought things that we can't uh, let the genie go back in the bottle for, right? So this whole conversation around mental health and recognition that there's many different types of mental health issues that people uh, will face and that they'll struggle with and a recognition of the statistics of how many people we're talking about will actually face um, some sort of mental health issue 
um, in a given year. Combined with now, there's also been a lot of studies done that shows the positive return on investment, right? So for those commercially minded folks, there's a clear ROI. Deloitte Canada did a wonderful study that showed uh, for every dollar you put into a workplace mental health program, you can uh, typically expect $2.20 return in terms of productivity, engagement, all those things. So more and more organizations are buying into this and now they're seeing it as a business lever, a differentiator, and then obviously, yes, the right thing to do on top of that. So I think we've got a lot of momentum. We've got to keep it going. The, the system is broken, though. It's fragmented, right? So what we can't have is employers doing things over here, governments doing things over there, individuals who are falling in the gap between governments and employers, being completely lost, having no idea how to navigate the healthcare system. So that's where, in my opinion, the next part of the journey has to come from uh, collaboration between the key stakeholders. And there's, there's good momentum going there. The Mental Health Commission of Canada is trying to bring public and private payers together to think about, okay, how do we together tackle um, this mental health pandemic within the pandemic, right? So a lot of good things um, are there. We just need to crystallize that into action. Okay. I love I love what you said there. Let's expand that a little further into diversity, inclusion, and equity. Yes. Um, again, interesting. So let's say 2015, no, maybe like maybe 2012, I started hearing like more and more about it as I was working in this space. And working in the not-for-profit, it had always been a, a big conversation uh, because they're like people who are already quite socially minded, like, you know, very liberal viewpoints. When I started working in the corporate world, yeah, it was there, but I didn't start noticing like big, big pushes until getting around 2014, 2015. But again, it was like these, you know, like, oh, right, we got our women in leadership program or let's spend this amount of money or yeah, you got this thing. And it was always very, um, for every program, the conversation like the marketing conversation around it was always a lot more than it seemed like organizations weren't like investing and in making sure that it didn't just happen, but that it was successful. Cause you know, there's a big difference between doing a training or doing a thing versus doing that and then making sure it's successful and it carries on and it builds momentum. And then of course comes, um, what's been happening in, in the past, I'd say the past three years and, uh, it's gotten bigger and bigger and bigger. And then it hit like a, a real pitch fever within the past couple of years. One of the things that I have actually personally witnessed being a coach that works at like very senior levels and major organizations is the behind the scenes of the like, do we really want to fund that this year? Are we getting the return for an investment? And very specifically, there's one conversation I'll never forget that I saw uh, an, a senior executive who had done the daunting task of actually doing what you'd mentioned Deloitte did around mental health. This executive had been like, hey, for every dollar we invest in this, here's the actual like hardline return. And it's it's significant. And this executive giving this really wonderfully worded, very thoughtful, passionate, like appropriately passionate uh, presentation to the rest of their you know C-suite uh, executives about it and everyone else just being on iPads, like, you know, playing on their phone or whatever. And then afterwards, when I, when I talked to the CEO and I was like, Hey, this is really bad. Like that was a, that was a really good business case. Uh, the leader then saying like, I don't really believe in that kumbaya stuff. We just kind of have to do it. I'll never, ever forget that. And I, I don't oh work, God. I don't work with that organization as a result of that conversation. It was like a terrible, uh, terrible discussion. And the thing that always stands out to me about all of this is at some point behind the curtain, there actually are decision makers and whatever they personally think about this is what's going to happen on some level. So it seems to have taken again, like a global crisis for real things to start happening. First of all, I want to get your thoughts on why is that? And then how do we actually make these change sustain and keep going? Yeah, I mean, this is a topic I love to talk about. It's, it's a very personal one for me, right? So while I have privilege by virtue of being a male and also by virtue of the position I have in the workplace, right? I'm also an immigrant, a Muslim, and a person of color, right? So I thought about my own journey and my own expectations. So one of the things I think that has changed dramatically over the last few years is expectations uh, from underrepresented groups in terms of what they want out of this whole conversation, right? And when I was growing up, what I wanted was just to be seen like everyone else. Like I didn't want my color uh, or religion to get in the way of opportunities, right? So I'm like, just see me like you see everyone else. And if the more people did that, the better I felt. That was my expectation. So I've got three kids. 
uh, two girls who are in university and then a son who's in his last year of high school. I've learned so much from my two daughters in particular about diversity, equity, inclusion, and what you should expect. They, well, when I tell them what I just told you about what my expectation was, they get so upset with me, right? And it's that adage that is well known now, but it was new to me when they started talking about it was, you know, Baba, that's what they call it, dad. Don't you know if they don't see your color, they don't see you. Mm. Right? So now everyone says that, right? But when I, when they told me this a couple of years ago, I said, like, well, okay, well, that's pretty insightful, right? I said, why are you expecting them? They should make space for you in the workplace or wherever to be who you are, to be your true self. And I think this, that generation has started a conversation and is helping to change the expectation. The events that we've seen the last couple of years in particular have just heightened that to a level now where I think um, that conversation forever changed. I think the other big shift that we've made in this conversation is that shifting from that notion of equality to equity, right? And recognizing that these groups who face systemic barriers for years and years, we need to do special things to lift them, right? We just can't treat them the same because they're not on the same footing. And that's been a very difficult conversation. So uh, we've got these two um, signature uh, social impact programs. One of them is Room for Her. It's focused on women's mental health. We launched it in November uh, because everything women have gone through. You think about women in the workplace, right? Uh, systemic barriers for years and years. 100,000 Canadian women have left the workforce during COVID-19 because the responsibility for child care, senior care has disproportionately fallen on them. As so more of us have been spending more time at home, uh, the rate of spousal abuse uh, has unfortunately increased. So they're facing so much. So we funded on our own a mental health program focused on women. We launched it, largely received very positive. There was, and it still is, a subset of the feedback we get from people who are very upset with us. Because they're like, why are you funding only women's mental health? Doesn't men's mental health matter? Of course, men's mental health matters. And there's a whole variety of services available to everyone around mental health. We are trying to solve a specific problem against a group who's been disproportionately impacted and has faced systemic barriers in the workplace, right? So there's still work to be done in terms of changing some of the mindset more broadly and bringing people along. Um, But I, I just love where we are and I'm finding more and more organizations are taking this seriously. I know we are at Green Shield. I, I, I join other groups um, to learn about what they're doing from a DEI perspective. And I see a level of commitment uh, and authenticity now around tackling this problem that I've never seen before. Yeah. Um, do you mind if I tag on a story that might illuminate that, what yeah. you just said there? Yeah. Um, you know, there is that saying, there's no stupid questions. And I actually disagree with that. There are, <laughs> there are certainly stupid questions. Uh, and I witnessed one uh, when I was younger in my career. I was, uh, I was in a newly formed team and we were going through a uh, specialized training to how, how to work with First Nations populations and like really specialized. And, and within the group, we actually also had some um, designated First uh, Nations workers and um, that were from uh, First Nation population. And um uh, this dude on the team, this white dude, of which I am also a white dude. So like, I wasn't like, Oh, that white dude. Like I'm, you know, like, but like this guy asked with this air of, I will never forget the look on this idiot's face where he was like, well, you know, um, why, why, or, you know, we've got this first nations training. Where's our white male Catholic training literally asked this in this oh, meeting in front of everybody and just dead silence. And every head went, looked at the leader like what are you going to say and the leader writing a note looked up and went oh that would be everyday life so yeah and I went back down and everyone starts laughing and the guy could not believe that this is what was the answer it's like yeah everyday life trains trains people about like you know about like the typical white experience yes, because that's exactly. what North America yeah. is based on. I love what you said about that idea of like your goal used to be like, Hey, I don't want people to see my color. I just, I just want to fit in. Yeah. So, you know, I grew up, uh, my parents are, are come from a mixed marriage, uh, uh, ethnically mixed marriage. My father is Armenian. My mother is, uh, is Irish, like really like quite yeah. a different mix and first name Aram, last name Arslanian. And I grew up in Calgary, Alberta in the seventies and eighties. And yeah. I used to be like, in my heart of hearts, I was like, I wish my name was like Steve. Like, I wish my name was like John, you know, like. My wish name was David. Right, okay, <laughs> totally. 
Where I was like, I wish I had a nickname that wasn't like derogatory to like my my culture or my name. Like I wish yeah. I wish it was like my nickname was like you know like whatever like whatever nickname. Yeah. And as I got older, I realized is like what well, first of all like I'm Caucasian, so because both of those the culturally are are, are, yeah. are essentially Caucasian. I remember thinking like, God, this is what I experienced was just having a different first and last name. But I'm beyond that. I'm just like, you know, I fit in with any crowd. What must it be like to to have the the experience of it going beyond just your name and having you know, these different experiences? Because I remember as a kid, I got bullied like crazy just about my name being different. And, you know, it's the time, it's place, it's just little kids. But also like growing up and having all of the experiences. And I laugh about it. I take no offense to when people like, they they don't know how to say my name, so they just go, "Hey, how you doing?" And they look, <laughs> and they just kind of bubble. Yeah, and I get it. I totally get it. And I again, I take zero offense, but these experiences I've had as being just like a Caucasian guy, but with this exotic sounding name. Yes has been really profound. And as a kid, I was so desperate to fit in. And and that really did carry me quite a bit in my adulthood. It made this deep sense of, I just want to fit in with people. I don't want to be different. And a lot of the thinking of just being like, hey, that's actually the problem. You shouldn't want to fit in. You should you should be viewed as uh, as who you actually are. Exactly. And we can we can, within a society, we can move or to maneuver to create that space. And it's not going to cost anyone anything. It just costs all of us a little bit of energy, time, thoughtfulness. So I love what you're saying around how your perspective on this shifted, because that shift that you had is actually what I think is essential for the business culture to shift effectively. Exactly. Yep. And we're seeing that now, right? And uh, at Green Show, we've we formed these employee resource groups. So this isn't something that can be led from the top. It has to be organic and grow and then management needs to support it, enable it. But these employee resource groups, we formed around each equity seeking group that was identified through workplace surveys that we did. You know, they're helping us put in initiatives that at the end are really about making sure the workplace has room for them to be who they are. And each of them are different. But then the collection of that, once we uh, actually implement some of their ideas, will make us a better organization. I truly believe that. Yeah, I I love that. All right, as we're getting uh, closer to the end of our conversation, I got three questions for you. But before I go into any of them, is there anything you want to add in? Anything that you want to talk about or focus on? Um, yeah, we'd love to talk a bit more about uh, our two social impact programs if we have time uh, please. for her and Green Door. Yeah. yeah, yeah, please tell us all about them. Oh, yeah, okay, perfect. So as I said, so from a social mission perspective, we're really focused on oral health and mental health, and we are trying to target the underserved and disadvantaged populations. So for Green Door, which is our oral health project, um, what we've seen is there's this group called the Working Poor who just don't have coverage for oral health services at all. Um, They make too much money to qualify for um, income-assisted support for dental benefits that the government provides, yet they work for organizations who don't offer them employer plans to cover the dental services. So in essence, what happens is they don't get any dental care because uh, they have to prioritize food, shelter, things like that. And we estimate that's about 30% of the Canadian population. Yet this is a topic that just doesn't get any public policy time, right? We talk about national pharmacare. Uh, we talk now about mental health as we should be. Um, all sorts of causes, but you never hear anyone talk about oral health, right? Uh, they view it almost as voluntary. It doesn't really matter what's happening in your mouth. You're still fine otherwise. But what we have seen is that poor oral health has an impact on broader health. And so what we've done to try and spark a conversation around this through this Green Door initiative is twofold. So one is we invested $6 million in a research partnership with the University of Toronto. And they're going to do a study to actually show the impact of poor oral health has on other population health factors. And we're hoping that will get public and private payers more focused on funding this as an important uh, cause, right? There's been a lot of good conversation now as we emerge from the pandemic. What does the healthcare system uh, need to look like? We want oral health to be more prioritized. And the other thing we're trying to do to put our money where our mouth is beyond funding the research is we've actually started to open clinics focused on serving this working poor group. So we've now got one in Toronto, one in Kenora, and one in Niagara Falls. And I've been to them. And the stories I hear around is just so, so inspiring is, you know, it's one lady who she liked the pandemic because she had to wear a mask and no one could, could see uh, the state of her mouth, which was causing significant drop in self-confidence. 
So she loved it and she was actually getting anxious as restrictions were lifting that she would have to now remove her mask again. So she came into the clinic. She got some work done. Next week, she got a job. She had enough confidence to go for an interview. The interview got, uh, went well and she um, became employed for the first time in a while. And so when I met her at the clinic and she told me this story, just the pride with which she was saying, it, was just, it just had such an impact on me, right? So it's, these, it's this storytelling component too um, that just doesn't get across on the oral health side. So I just think it's such an important cause that we're trying to support. All right. It's, it's wild what you just said. Cause I just had like a huge aha moment. Like I've never, so yes, like 100%, I have never, ever, ever thought about that component about like how oral health and like just, and again, from oral health, just like, if you look at your smile in the mirror, do you feel, feel good about it and how that can impact people's confidence and not that someone wouldn't hire someone because they didn't have like whatever the ideal version of teeth is, is that it could impact someone's confidence so much that it would hinder their their confidence in going for an interview or feeling like maybe certain kinds of jobs they wouldn't be accepted into because what they perceive they'd be judged as because of their teeth that is a really salient and strong point to consider here around yeah. health just kind of like the general health picture okay that's cool um what about what about the other program yes yeah, so the other program i mentioned earlier is room for her so our signature women's mental health program so what we're trying to do there is provide education and support for women who are struggling during the pandemic as well as counseling services if they need to speak to someone um, through this mental health company that we acquired about a year ago. We're making 10,000 hours of counseling available for free, fully funded by Greenshield. And uh, we just rolled that out in November and we're seeing good utilization. But, you know, for, for those who are listening and, and need help, I would strongly encourage them to help us there. Um, to really call that service, that we're going to launch a website in the next couple of months. So there's tools and resources uh, for women who just want to understand what can they do um, to get support for the mental health because it, it's just it is unbelievable what's happened right and it's so alarming to me that 100,000 Canadian women had to leave the workforce during the pandemic um, so we're trying to implement this as a program not only to bring them back but also to increase participation rates more generally in the workplace but also specifically in leadership roles right goes back to the whole discussion we we're having earlier about DE&I um, you know but women is, is an underrepresented group in the workforce force, particularly in leadership roles and I think mental health is sometimes at the cause of it, right? Um, they, they, may ex they experience things that men just don't in the workplace and, and this is what we're trying to solve for. So it's, gonna, it's the first year of a multi-year investment in women's mental health and we'll look to expand where, where the need is. Excellent. Okay, so here are my three questions for you. Perfect. What's one specific thing that you've learned about Green Shield that you did not know before the pandemic? Um. The dynamic of a union employer relationship. So I don't know if that's where you wanted me to go with that, but if I'm totally honest, that was the biggest learning for me because I had never worked at a unionized organization before. So Green Shield, about 55% of our staff is unionized. And just, you know, and it's, it's, it's a deep relationship. So a big part of why Green Shield grew is very early on it formed a relationship with what was then the United Auto Workers. It became Canadian Auto Workers, now Unifor. Uh, where there's also a business partnership. So oftentimes when Unifor would uh, represent a workforce, they would recommend uh, Green Shield as a benefits provider. So this, this, this dynamic of this successful partnership with a labor organization has been something new for me. Um, and and it's, it's really changed my view of uh, what an employer-union relationship can look like. It can be multifaceted, right? It's not just about uh, representing employees in the workplace, but it's how you can partner externally to grow uh, the organization. So that, that's been one big, big learning for me. Okay, cool. Uh, what's one thing that within your industry you would like to see change? Well, that's a great question. Um, it's, this, it's this how we rally to support mental health. Oftentimes in the insurance industry, we come in at the back end once there's a claim. But imagine all the individual has to go through before they actually file a claim for a service, right? First, they have to recognize that they have an issue. Then they have to seek care. Then they have to receive the care. And then they file the claim. Right? But I think we as an industry can help so much earlier on, even before the, that first issue arises, to prevent the issue from happening in the first place. Um, there's a great uh, survey done by Benefits Canada recently that 82% of Canadian workers want their employers to provide virtual healthcare services. And who do employers go to? for getting access to virtual healthcare services is the insurance industry. 
So I think we can do much, much more in that regard, particularly around mental health, uh, given there's a lot of coverage gaps in the public health care system around mental health. Excellent. Okay. I love that. And I really like that one. Uh, final question. What would you like to see be different? Something specific you'd like to see different in the business culture in, in, in Canada in general? Um, I think it's what you and I were talking earlier about diversity, equity, and inclusion. I've, I'd love to see all organizations embrace that in a meaningful way, not just signing on for pledges, right? There's a 50-30 government challenge. Um, we've got other challenges for other underrepresented groups, but to really embrace it, see it as a business imperative and take meaningful action, which then will lift all of society, particularly these equity-seeking groups that have faced obstacles for so many years. So I'd love to see a much more actionable commitment around that. Heck yeah. All right. So where can people find you and find out more about GreenShield? Yeah. So you can visit our, our website. We've got a lot of good information there. So greenshield.ca and, uh, you know, you know, find me on LinkedIn and be happy to connect with folks. All right. Awesome. Well, listen, thank you so much for joining us. Any last words, anything you want to share with our audience before we sign off? No, just thank you. This was a wonderful discussion. I really enjoyed it. Listen, you killed it. I, I literally was looking at the time. I'm like, if I ask that question, we're going to talk for another 20 minutes. I want to make be respectful of your time. Uh, you're awesome. This was an incredible conversation. You're, you're just the best. I really appreciate you being on. So I will, uh, ch- I will talk to you after we uh, wrap up here. And everyone else, I'll see you in the outro. Spencer, drop the beat. What?